Welcome to our first class over systematic theology. I'm uh, Dr. James Brooks, and I'm going to be leading us for the next few weeks in an overview of systematic theology. I can remember of all of the classes that I took in seminary and Bible college, one of my most favorite class was classes dealing with systematic theology because that's where we begin to know and understand God. So to begin today, I thought we might take a little bit of time to go through and define uh, and kind of lay out in terms uh, where we're going to be going. So uh, we're going to begin by looking at and defining what systematic theology is and then why we should study theology. We're going to look briefly at worldview and what a worldview is and what kind of worldview one needs to have in order to understand and discern theology. So let's jump right in and begin by defining our terms. Now, the word theology comes from two Greek words. The first word is the word theos, which is the Greek word for God. And the suffix is the word logos, uh, from where also we find this word over, for example, in John 1. In the beginning was the word, the logos. The word was with God. And the word was God. Here, the term logos means a word about, or it means to express rational thought. Uh, in this case, a rational interpretation of our religious faith and experience. And so theology then is simply a word about God. Thus, Christian theology means that we are trying to develop a rational interpretation for our Christian faith. Now, in terms of theology, there are differing types of theologies. Some of the big ones that we find in systematic theology books uh, would be historical theology. And this is trying to look at the history of the Christian faith uh, and tries to focus in on from a historical perspective, who God is and how he has dealt with uh, his people. Another facet of theology, in addition to historical theology, would be biblical theology. And this is where the theologian tries to sit down and discern and ascertain uh, what the Bible says about a particular subject from the book of Genesis all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. And so that's what biblical theology does. And then systematic theology presents the data that is the biblical data regarding a subject uh, by late, taking into account everything. It takes into account historical theology and biblical theology. Uh, it takes into account apostolic theology, um, apologetic theology. And from all of those various fields of study, uh, systematizes that data into one body of doctrine, and that's what we call systematic theology. Now, in terms of systematic, it refers to something being simply put in a system. I know most of us don't really like systems, but here it becomes quite helpful for us because in, in terms of our theology, uh, it, it helps us give us a, a definition of what systematic theology is, and that would be this that systematic theology is the collecting, the scientifically arranging, the comparing, the exhibiting, and the defending of all the facts from any and every source concerning God and his works. Now, that's a pretty good definition. I actually got that from Dr. Lewis Sperry Chafer in his systematic theology uh, works, uh, which he uh, published several years ago. Now, to give you an example of what systematic theology is, let's take into account a subject that we find in the Bible. For example, let's take angels. If you look at angels and where and when and how it is discussed in Scripture, many books of the Bible give us information about angels. However, no one book in its totality gives us all information about angels. Therefore, what systematic theology does is it, it takes all the information about angels from all of the books of the Bible, 
and then organizes it into a system called angelology, for example, a subheading of systematic theology. Uh, and while we're talking about that, let's take a moment or two to discuss what we, we find in these various subheadings, because regardless of what kind of systematic theology book uh, that you pick up, whether it's one written by Charles Ryrie or one written by John MacArthur or one written by Louis Burkhoff, all of them follow a format in the subtopics of the discussion under the heading of systematic theology. For example, theology proper is generally one of the first subjects discussed in theology works, and this simply means a study of God. Uh, it comes from the Greek word, which means father. That is theology proper or the study of God in terms of his attributes, his being, his character, and so forth. Another subheading under the banner of systematic theology would be that of Christology, and this is the study of Christ. And then alongside that would be pneumatology, which is the study of the Holy Spirit. Uh, now, you might be asking, well, why do we call it pneumatology if it's the study of the Holy Spirit? Isn't that a study of numbers? Actually, that would be numerology, the study of numbers. Pneumatology, the reason they call it that is because the word pneuma, the prefix there, the word, comes from the Greek word, which means spirit, wind, or air. So they would call it pneumatology. Another subheading that we find in systematic theology is that a bibliology, which is the study of the Bible. And then after that, we would normally find soteriology, which is the study of salvation. And it comes from the Greek word, which means savior or preserver. And then in there, we also find ecclesiology. Uh, you might have heard that word before in church, the ecclesia, the, the body or, of Christ, or the people, those who have been called out. Uh, so ecclesia or ecclesiology is the study of the church. Another category, and we normally find this at the last part of the book in any systematic theology work, and that is the the study of eschatology or the study of last things. And then we have other subheadings such as angelology, uh, harmartiology, which is the study of sin, and then also anthropology, which is the biblical study and the biblical understanding of man. So those are the various subheadings that we find in our study of systematic theology. So we would ask, why study theology? The reason we study theology is because everyone is a theologian. Whether that person be a Christian or whether that person is not a believer at all. But everyone has some idea of God. Uh, everyone is a theologian, but not everyone is a good theologian. So we study theology to help us enrich our Christian faith, to enhance our knowledge of God. We study the theology because uh, it helps us to find answers to the questions that arise in the course and scope of Christian living. All of us have a belief system, and we need to develop a good theology so that when the, the pressures and the trials and the tests of life come, we have something to fall back on to help us understand what's occurring in the Christian life. Now you say, why is that important? It's important because, for example, let's take an issue that we find in today's temporary culture. Many of the politicians of a particular uh, party uh, are telling the world and telling the people that live in this country that the world is going to end in 12 years. Now, given the current state of the virus and the things that are occurring in the world, such as the calamities and the natural disasters and so forth, one might be asking uh, that question. Uh, is the world going to end in 10 years or 12 years, as some would say? Well, when one is a good theologian and has studied systematic theology, uh, we can go back and think about uh, the theology of God's covenants, 
More particularly, I'm speaking of one particular covenant, the Noahic covenant. Remember when God destroyed the world by flood, uh, other than Noah and his family, who were the only ones spared, every living creature on the face of the earth died as a result of God's judgment. Well, when God made a covenant with Noah, as symbolized by the sign of the rainbow, Genesis chapter 8, God reveals for us some information that's imperative for us to know in terms of looking at the world even from our standpoint into the future. It gives us some stability. For example, in Genesis chapter 8, beginning in verse 21, Word of God says, The Lord smelled the soothing aroma that Noah had prepared after the flood and made a sacrifice and built an altar to God. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, now watch this, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter, that is the seasons that we experience, and day and night, watch this, shall not cease. So if that's the case, the future of this world is dependent upon this particular promise. So when politicians or when people or when professors or when neighbors or anyone who has view or belief that is contrary to scripture says the world's going to end in 10 years, that's not true. Because God said that until he eventually revamps this world, and we find that out in 2 Peter chapter 3, something still future to us, distant in the future, uh, that this world will continue. This world is not going to end in 10 years or it's not going to end in 12 years uh, because God has promised uh, that he will sustain this world. So we can take great confidence in that. But that's one of the reasons why we study theology, because it gives us the answers to those difficult questions. Now, here is something that's going to require you to do a little bit of work. We study theology so that we may know more about God, but we study theology and it requires us to do something. It requires us to do first and foremost work. Becoming a theologian is going to require you to do some work, particularly uh, you're going to have to do a lot of reading. You're going to have to do a lot of reading about what theologians have said and recorded in the past. In addition to the things that we learn in the Bible, we can learn a lot from those who uh, Christians who have gone before us through church history. So it requires us to do a lot of work and it requires us to be interested in knowing God. One theologian said we need to make it our goal in life to know him, that is to know God, more than we know anything. And to delight in him more than we delight in anything else. So it requires us to be interested in God. It requires us to do some hard work. That is by means of study. And you must be currently dissatisfied with your current level. I mean, fully, we, there's no way for us to know God exhaustively because he is inexhaustible. But the more that you know him, the more you are able to reflect his life and his character in this world. And so that's uh, one of the reasons or some of the reasons why we desire to study systematic theology. Now, in closing today, let's talk a little bit about worldview. A worldview is the data that once it is accumulated from our study, we it's an internal system that we have that compartmentalizes this data into various categories uh, so that when we come across the things that's going on out there in life, it helps us to understand and make sense out of the world. And so a worldview fundamentally then helps us filter what's going on out in the world, how we think about the world and how we think about God. Now, our worldview comes from several different sources, and all of us have a worldview. I don't care if you're a two-year-old who has a very unsophisticated worldview, 
or if you perhaps have been an academic your entire life and hold several degrees and so forth, uh, you have a worldview as well, both believers and non-believers, but everyone has a worldview. And a worldview is developed and comes from various sources. The first and foremost is that we have innate ideas. Greek philosophy has always debated where uh, data comes from and how we know, and that is the field or study of epistemology, how we know what we know. And some theologians and philosophers have said that data, how we synthesize things according to our worldview, is, is all comes from sense experience. That is the things that we sense out in the world. Nothing is in the mind, one philosopher said, which is not first in the senses. There's a very problematic issue with that particular worldview. For example, is that statement itself based upon sensory experience? And the answer is no, that's an internal or, or rational idea. Uh, but in terms of worldview, it comes from several different sources. The first is, is that it is an innate idea simply because we are created in the Imago Dei, that is the image of God. And as God's image bearers, uh, we know God simply by the fact that we are created in his image and likeness. Now, in addition to this internal witness or this internal knowledge, we also develop our worldview from the experiences that we have, our environments, and our education level. So all of those things help to shape and form our worldview. Now, in terms of a definition of worldview, we may say this, that a worldview is a network of presuppositional or core beliefs about the nature of reality, the nature of knowledge, and the nature of ethics. These beliefs that we have, these are not things that can be verified empirically. That is, they're not things that we can see or taste or touch or hear or smell, but are those fundamental or core beliefs by which we seek to prove everything else in our experience. By that, then, we may say this, that what your worldview would basically consist of is this, what you believe is real, that is metaphysics, how you know what you know, epistemology or the theory of knowledge, and then what is right or good? In other words, how should I live in terms of how I answer uh, those questions? What is real and how do I know what I know? That is the field or study of axiology. Now, I said that a worldview is a network of presuppositional beliefs. What are presuppositional beliefs? A presupposition, and I'm getting this information from one of my theological mentors, Dr. Greg Bonson, in his work on Van Til's presuppositionalism, he says that a presuppositional belief is this. It is an elementary assumption in one's reasoning by which your opinions are formed and they refer not just to any assumption in any type of argument, but to a personal commitment, which is at the most basic level of one's network core of beliefs. Presuppositions, he goes on to say, have the greatest authority in one's thinking, being treated as one's least negotiable beliefs and being the highest immunity to revision. Now, what Dr. Bonson is saying is this. He's saying all of our core beliefs are those beliefs which we desperately hang on to. That's why sometimes when you get into theological discussions about God and uh, his character or perhaps salvation, that when people have differing views on that, it's because their fundamental presuppositions about God uh, and salvation are so different. And because they hold on to those core beliefs, because they are the basis by which all other beliefs are formed, uh, they are the least likely beliefs that people will let go of, because it, it rocks their foundation if they do. And so that's why presuppositional beliefs are, are serious uh, for every uh, Christian. Now, we need to keep in mind when it comes to worldview in terms of developing a theology, that even though we're talking about individual subjects, our worldview is much like a Chinese food buffet. Those of you who've ever been to a Chinese food buffet, understand that when you go to a Chinese food buffet, you have all different types of food being laid out on the buffet. 
uh, we may say that that is very similar to all of the various beliefs that a person has about the nature of life and reality and what is real and how they should live. So a Chinese buffet is much like the accumulation of one's entire belief system. Now, the reason we study systematic theology is because because of the limitations of human language. You see, when it comes to discussing an issue, we can't discuss the entire issue to cover everything that is on the buffet. For example, based upon the picture that you see before you, it looks like there might be General Tso's chicken there in the very front on the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Let's say we're talking about General Tso's chicken. We're talking about one particular item that is on the buffet, but that one particular item that is on the buffet is related to every other item that is on the buffet. So that as we develop a worldview, one of the goals that we have as Christians is that when we develop beliefs in one particular area of our theology, it must be and it must comport with or comport to and be in coherence with all the other items on the buffet. I hope you're following me on that. What I'm basically saying is this. One cannot have contrary beliefs internally and have a consistent worldview. I get this all the time, for example, and I remember even seeing this when I was taught systematic theology. One of the best examples would be we would go through the doctrine of anthropology, the study of man. And we would look at how man has fallen into a state of sin uh, because of his spiritual death. That is, God unplugs man. Adam and Eve, when they sin in the garden, and all of their posterity come into a state of spiritual death when they are born into this world. They don't have to become sinners. They are born sinners into this world, and that is describing their, their nature and their propensities. So we'll go through the doctrine of anthropology, and most everyone in the class will agree with the professor and say, oh yeah, man is is lost and he's spiritually dead and he can't know and discern the things of God and so forth. And then when it comes to the doctrine of salvation, which would be another item on that Chinese food buffet, they would then say, well, no, you know, what about man has to have choice and he has to exercise free will and so forth. And those are issues we can get into later on in the study of our course. I'm simply bringing that up now to let you know how these inconsistencies can show themselves. So on the one hand, you have students who are affirming the, the spiritual depravity and the spiritual death of an individual in one facet of the theology course, uh, which in comparison to the picture would be the general so's chicken. And yet when we begin to discuss the Mugu Gaipan, uh, which would be salvation or the doctrine of soteriology, they become inconsistent because now they have man doing things which negates what they have learned in the doctrine of anthropology. That is, they are attempting to advance an inconsistency, an internal inconsistency in their theological beliefs. So, beloved, the reason I'm telling you that is because we want to be consistent all the way across the buffet. So I hope, again, as we begin to go through this, that you have some sense of the importance of, of this study. So how then, in closing, do we develop a biblical worldview? We develop a biblical worldview by what the scripture says itself. Peter writes over in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, and for those of you who are expositors who are watching this, you may have heard this verse before. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. That's our class verse. And what it's telling us to do is set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts. That is, all other data and knowledge must fall under the Lordship of Christ in order for us to make sense or have some level of discernment about those issues by which and through which we are discussing. And then Paul tells us how we are to develop a biblical worldview over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 when he says this, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. 
And so one of our goals, beloved, in being a good theologian is that we take body of data or knowledge, if you will, and again, we bring that in and make that comport to a worldview that is in submission to God and his word that is under the lordship of Christ. And so some of the implications then we have in our first class together in an introduction to systematic theology is this. Remember, everyone holds to a theology. Everyone is a theologian. The atheist has a theology. The agnostic has a theology. And you have a theology. And so our goal then is to hold and to develop a biblical uh, theology that is a systematic theology. And as Christians, our theology must be based upon Christian doctrine, biblical principles, and biblical truth. Remember, like I said, all Christians are theologians, but not all Christians are good theologians. And so it all starts and begins with what we believe and what we think about God. How big is God? If you want to be a biblical theologian, you have to have a very big view of who God is. Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, who was the pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, got invited to go back to his alma mater in Princeton and, and preach at the chapel. Barnhouse noted that the day that he showed up, he was very intimidated because all of the faculty were uh, sitting uh, on the front row. And one of the foremost faculty members that was there at Princeton was Dr. Robert Dick Wilson, who was, by all accounts, a brilliant theologian who was sitting right there on the front row. Barnhouse noted that he was preaching. He looked out over the audience and he saw Wilson get up after about five minutes and walk off to the side, exiting out the side door. Barnhouse began to think within himself, what in the world did I say to make him leave? At the end of the sermon, when he had finished everything, he made a beeline over to Dr. Wilson's office. He knocked on the door and Dr. Wilson said, come in. And Barnhouse said he went in and he told Dr. Wilson, he said, sir, if, I, if there's anything I said or anything that I did to offend you, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I noticed you got up and, and walked out of the sermon. And Wilson looked at him and he began to grin and he said, Barnhouse, he said, I always come back to see how our graduates preach. And I'm not necessarily listening for their sermon, but what I want to know is this, what is their view of God? And he said, I could tell after five minutes of listening to you preach that you're a big godder. That is, you have a high and exalted view of God, one that is uh, pictures God as being high and lifted up, one who demonstrates a sovereign God, a powerful God, a God that moves and responds to men. I didn't need any more time. So I'm telling that story to simply tell you this. Systematic theology helps you develop your view of God. And if you want to be a good systematic theologian, you must be a big Godder. And that, beloved, is where we begin our journey in this course. Join us next time as we continue our journey through systematic theology.